everyone. Good to have you all today. So we're going to start out in our Big Green Book on page 424. Let's sing about some heavenly sunlight as we're getting some beautiful sunlight through these windows. <laughs>
like to request?
comes out, even when they're asleep, they can wake up ready to go. Wake up in, in charge of life and, and ready to move. Obviously, when we're trying to win people to the Lord, we're trying to share the gospel of Jesus Christ. We're trying to get them to understand what it is to be a Christian and to know uh, uh, many, many things. But the most important thing that we try to get people to understand and to receive is nothing more than the love of God. I want you to think about the love of God. Now, when we try to convince people to be a Christian, it can be sometimes, uh, we, we can treat it like a job interview or, 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 or a, uh, what a job entails. And, and I think too often we forget that spreading the love of Jesus Christ is not about giving them every detail about how difficult a Christian life is going to be. You understand what I'm saying? We want to tell them, well, this will happen, and this will happen, and this will happen. And, 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 and to save people, you know, I, I, I watched a video one time. I think it was a Ray Comfort video, uh, if I remember right. And it said, we don't save, we don't, God doesn't save people so that they can have nice things. God doesn't save people so that they can get all of their wishes or they can have good health. He doesn't save them from all of those things. It's like when you put a parachute on and you're in an airplane, unless you're one of them goofy people that likes to jump out of airplanes, and you don't put it on because you're going to get nice things. You don't put it on so that you can have a good experience. Why do you put it on? To save you. To save you. We're not saved into a glamorous life of everything we want. That's not salvation. We are saved from a devil's hell and punishment for our sins. But when we look at it that way and we witness to others and we try to explain to them and get them to understand the love of God. I, you know, there are jobs here on this earth that if you try to get people to, to, to come in and take, you don't tell them all the details. <laughs> Why not? You want, them to, you want them to not be scared off, right? I want you to think about this. If you interviewed for, for a job and you had to make a decision about this job, and you're thinking about it, it doesn't seem logical to do this. Do you understand what I'm saying? There, there are times when you're established in something and you have to make a switch. And people will look at you for making that switch in their life and they'll say, what are you doing? You understand what I'm talking about? It doesn't seem logical. Or maybe maybe you doing this is not the popular thing to do. You know, there are groups where being a Christian is the popular thing to do. And they call it positive peer pressure, I guess. But in my opinion, it's not really peer pressure. It, it's not. It, 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 if you're becoming a Christian because it's the popular thing to do, you're probably not becoming a Christian. Does that make sense? But it, it's probably not going to be popular with those that you love. or uh, Especially if you come from a family of non-believers. To become a Christian is not going to be the popular thing to do. That might not be the thing you tell them when you're witnessing to them. It says it won't win you any worldly praise. If, if, if we think about it, how many people get trophies in life for being a Christian? You understand what I'm saying? What do most Christian stands get you in this world? Yell that you're some sort of, uh, 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 you're either a, a thisist or a thatist or, or whatever. And, 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 and it's not something uh, that the world is going to praise. They're not going to see you and say you're doing something great because you're making a stand for God. And I'm talking about those people that will truly make a stand for God even when the popular opinion is something else. It's, uh, you will suffer uh, much ridicule for doing uh, the things that you, you are doing. You will suffer much ridicule uh, for being a Christian. You know, if I stand up and say, and, and, and if I stand up and say, this is not right and we should not be a part of this, and everybody wants to be a part of it, what do they think about me? I'm nuts. I'm a stick in the mud. I've had a stick in the mud. Anybody had a stick in the mud? If you ever spend any time around the Mississippi River, you've had a stick in the mud. I remember one time I was out there 
snagging these, trying to get a spoon bill, which Don seems to know how to get. I, I, always, <laughs> I catch them sometimes, but they're like that long, including the bill. Uh, I'm out there catching carp, big old Asian carp. And I'm standing there on that Mississippi mud. I learned something. Now I, there's always trash around the bank. There'll be a big piece of plastic or something. I'll lay that down. And I'll stand on that in order to do it. Because I found myself one time, I had to leave my boots. Do you know why? I was rocking back and forth in there, running that snagging rod. And the next thing I know, I looked down, and I had mud up to about here. And there wasn't nothing going to move me out of that other than taking my shoes off. So to this day, probably on the bottom of that silt somewhere, my boots have probably worked their way down the Mississippi River. Who knows where they wound up. But... Some people will, will think you're a big stick in the mud because all of a sudden those things that you used to do, when you become a believer, what happens to them? And those people that like to do those things with you, what do they still want to do? Those things. And when you refuse to do those things, all of a sudden you become a stick in the mud. You become that, that friend that's no fun. And, 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 and you have to deal with that problem. Well, uh, you... You, you will have to do things that you're not comfortable with when you become a Christian. You want to win somebody to Christ and say, now if you take this, if you accept this, then you're going to have to do a lot of things you don't want to do. <laughs> Is that going to win anybody to the Lord? Absolutely not. My God, I don't want to. They have six huge dogs in front of their house. I don't want to stop there and invite them to church, right? Of course, them six huge dogs might lick you to death rather than eat you. You don't know that. Uh, God, I'm not like those people. Right? And, and in the truth, we like, we're comforted around people that are like us. And I'm not talking about skin color. I'm talking about that are like us or whatever. We get comfortable around people that, that are, are like us. But when we have to speak to people that are not like us, what happens? You get uncomfortable. You get uncomfortable. They call that your comfort zone. Oh, how about this? You know, promotions are given often or, or after evaluation. Promotions are given after. How many of us would like to sit before God this morning and be evaluated for our Christian walk? No, I'm, I'm not going to look. You don't have to raise your hand. I'm right there with you. <laughs> you must be willing to be on call 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Oh, and you must read this huge, huge manual <laughs> on how to do your job. You have to read this huge manual. You must give 10% of everything you make back. What? Who's going to take that? I don't want to be a part of that. You may be required to relocate at the boss's discretion. I want you to think about this. You may have to clean up a mess that you did not make. I don't want to do that, do you? But you can't beat the retirement. Do you understand the Christian walk? And, 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 and the reason I'm getting at this, if we go around... We go around complaining about how difficult our life is to the people we're trying to win. What are they going to say? Why do it? Why would I want to be a part of that? My job as a pastor, when there is a believer that is struggling with something, I am to help them with that. I understand that. And also, as a witness, not even just throw the pastor thing out of it, my job as a Christian is to teach people about the love of Jesus Christ. And here's the thing. If I'm sharing the love of Christ with them, I don't have to go into detail about this list of things that Christians have to do. I have to share with them that they are bound for hell because of sins that are in their life. And if they accept Jesus Christ as Savior, what do they receive? A ticket to heaven and all of their sins are forgiven. It's more important that I teach them about their soul being saved than anything else that I can teach them in Scripture. I'm talking about the non-Christian, the person who doesn't know Jesus Christ as Savior. My job is to share the love of God with them and show them Jesus Christ through my actions and through my words and through, through life itself. Now, now, when a person becomes a believer, I am, uh, and we, we are supposed to see them get saved when God does that. And then what's our next step with them? Discipleship. 
This list is discipleship. You understand what I'm saying? This list, do you, do you know, when, when, and, when, and I mentioned this a week or two ago, but you know when Paul, uh, when, when he, was it Lydia on the beach? Was that her name? He witnessed to her and he told her about the love of God in, that she needed in her life and she was saved. He witnessed to King Agrippa and told him about the love in his life that changed him. And King Agrippa said, almost thou hast persuaded me to be a Christian. He didn't teach them this list, did he? I threw the list down. He didn't teach them that list of stuff. He told them about the love of God. Now, when Paul walked into the church and addressed Peter, he got the list out. He understands that uh, this is not right. This is not right. This is and, and this is discipleship. Now, discipleship is not just telling people what all they're doing wrong. It's teaching them what they need to do right, more so than teaching them what they're doing wrong. But what I'm getting at is Christians are trying to win the world by telling them what they're doing wrong. And you're not going to win the world by telling them what they're doing wrong. You're going to win the world by telling them about the love of Jesus Christ. Once they have received the love of Jesus Christ in their life and the Spirit of God is moving in their heart and in their soul and in their mind, then they're going to have a desire to tweak the things in their life into aligning with what Scripture teaches. Then you start the discipleship. And I've learned something about helping people overcome issues in their life. If they're a believer, do they know what they're doing is wrong? Mm -hmm. Do I need to lord over them and tell them how wrong it is? No. I am to teach them to pray. I am to teach them to have a closer walk with the Lord. I am to teach them how to study their scripture in the proper way. And if they do those things, if they become a praying person and a praying person often and a listening person to God, and they begin to read the scripture for what it says, who's going to teach them about change? Jesus. It ain't going to be me, is it? If I try to convince them to change their life, they're going to tell me I'm that high and mighty, high fluting preacher over there that thinks I know more about their life than they do. I don't know diddly about their life. That's between them and God. But I know a man that does know, and I know the relationship that they can have with him. And if I teach them about the love of Christ and they have the Spirit of God in them, they're going to have a yearning for what's right and what's wrong, and they're going to have a desire to have a life that is aligned with the Word of God and with the will of God. I really, really am cautious with preachers who tell you that they know the will of God in your life. I can guarantee you that the will of God in your life is that you come to repentance and salvation. I can guarantee that. But after that, the work that God has in you and the time frame that God is going to do that work is not my job, my responsibility, or anything under my authority. You understand that every, and children, if you work around children, have children, been around children, what do you learn about children as they grow? They don't listen. <laughs> well... <laughs> Don't judge their speed and their rate of how fast they get there. Don't do it. You know, I'll use Nate as an example this morning. He took some test in third grade, I think it was, in Farmington called the I-Ready Math Test. And they were beginning to get concerned because I think six hours into this test, he was still doing it. And the teacher began to worry that maybe, maybe he had a problem. And then they found out he got the highest score in the entire third grade of Farmington School District on the I-Ready math test. Just because it's taking a while doesn't mean that it's not right. You know, and, and there were other kids that flew through it that did really well too. And, and, and we, we, we have that idea about Christians. Well, they were saved a month ago. They should have given up all that stuff by now. Well, how come you didn't give up judgmental attitude? <laughs> Right? Right? We, we, we try to say that they should be this way or they should be that way. And in reality, God is working on them at the rate and pace that them and God are working out. I can say honestly about my own life, I should be farther in my Christian walk than I am. I think anybody should be able to say that about their life. But I, I, I don't need others telling me what the hindrances are. 
I know what they are. The Word of God is very clear and teaches me what they are. If I can teach you about the Word of God, if I can teach you about how to study the Word of God and how to pray, I'm giving you the means and the equipment to know God's will in your life. I don't have to do it. I don't have to be the doctor, if you will, that fixes it. The Bible says that He is the great physician. Not the pastor, not the Sunday school teacher, not the director of this or that, not the youth pastor, not, not any of these things. Those aren't the great physician. The great physician is God himself. I can introduce you to the things that will heal you. I can introduce you to those items. And if you do not receive it, and if you do not take it, then you're not going to get the healing from God. But the healing is never going to come from me. I've told you often, and I say it all the time, people ask me, how many souls have you won to the kingdom of God? And I say, none. And they look at me like, well, my Bible says, if I, if I be lifted up, I will draw all men unto me. If God allows me to help be a stepping stone in that process as he's drawing them, I give him all the glory and the credit. If I've knelt with somebody and watched them receive Jesus Christ as Savior, I feel that to be a blessing and thank God that I was there to witness it. But I had absolutely zero to do with the Spirit moving into their heart and piercing their soul and making them become a child of God. That is nothing that I did. I have no credit for that whatsoever. But there is nothing more joyous than watching someone find Jesus Christ. There is nothing more powerful and there is nothing that moves you more. The Bible says that angels rejoice in heaven over everyone that accepts Jesus Christ as Savior. And I think too often, especially in Baptist churches, we're more concerned about these things. Name, residence, zip code, date, mailing address. And by the way, what decision did you make for the Lord today? We shouldn't be worried a whole lot about paperwork when somebody just received the grace of God in their heart and they're no longer bound for a devil's hell but have the full freedom of God in their life and they are going to live for eternity. And we're more concerned about getting a name on a piece of paper so that we can hang a plaque in the, in the foyer out there that says we were the top 10 in, in baptisms or, or salvations or whatever. I don't need a tally. I don't need a score. I just need to know that I am presenting the gospel and that people are receiving the gospel and that Jesus Christ is being proclaimed. I get excited. I really get excited about a lot of things. I'm a very uh, animated person. I'm a very adamant person. I like shooting those ducks and those geese. And I'm going to tell you something. You know, I, my last four ducks of this duck season were ones that people have tried to get for 30 years of their hunting career. And you'd have thought I was a little schoolgirl at a New Kids on the Block concert. <laughs> I was giddy, jumping up and down. I can't believe this. Nate witnessed it, didn't you? He got one of them ducks too, didn't he, bud? And, you know, we celebrate and we get excited. And I have these trophies around the house that I look at and I remember the hunt and this and that. I get excited about things. Nothing wrong with getting excited about the blessings, even of worldly things, that God has blessed us with. But when we can't get excited that a soul came to know Jesus Christ as Savior, then we need to really look at our Christian walk. We need to look at our life and we need to see whether we're sharing the love of God or not. And as excited as we get when someone receives Christ, we should also be devastated when someone refuses to receive Christ and be saddened about that instead of walk away from them and go, oh well. Now, I understand that there was a time when people in Scripture were told to dust the, 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 dust the shoes off their feet. That's not how it says it. Mm -hmm. to, to knock the dust off their feet and move on. I get that. But there still should not be an attitude of, oh, well. Even if God is telling me to move on, all that means is I did what God wanted me to do. He wants me to get out of the way so that he can do something with somebody else. That has nothing to do with me just forgetting about it. It doesn't mean that I don't have to care anymore. I should still have a burning hole in my heart, a yearning for those that I'm witnessing to to know Jesus Christ as Savior. I should be passionate about the fact that they are lost as much as I should celebrate when someone comes to know Jesus. When that father 
looked out across his property that day. And he's seen that son that he hadn't seen in a long time coming. And that son was, was walking up there. He began to run towards him. There was a little bitty bit of excitement. Do you understand what I'm saying? A little bitty bit of excitement. I've seen kids that parents couldn't find running around Walmart. The kids all got lost. You know how they hide in the clothes? And then they, what, what code do they run? And won't they, they tell you, there's a, you know, be looking for it. And I see that parent, tears in her eyes, run up to that child and grab them up and squeeze them. And then scold them. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I love you, but that was wrong. <laughs> you understand what I'm talking about? And, and this guy here, he'll hide in those clothes. I guarantee you that. He'll get in there. And, or you'll go to the water park, and he'll be stuck in one of those tunnels just hiding. And you're looking all over, all over the water park. You can't find him. Where's he at? Where's he at? And then you see him. What happens? Do you understand when God has a child... Come home, his heart explodes in joy. Because that one that wasn't there, that one that was lost, that one that was going to die, is saved. And he has them. And he wraps them in their arms. And the angels stand around and they celebrate what's going on. I think we have lightened up, watered it down, what it is to receive the love of God. The one who spoke into existence, light itself, cares enough to just listen to my rambling thoughts. <laughs> you ever dedicate an hour to prayer and 10 minutes in you're thinking about something else and forgot you were even praying? Can you imagine having a conversation with somebody and somewhere in it you just start talking to the wall? <laughs> you know, like, I'm over here. I'm, do you understand what I'm saying? God still, even though our ramblings and our, our drifting away here and there, he still, all right, let's, let's finish this conversation. He still listens to it. He still cares what I have to say. He cares about my thoughts. He cares about the struggles that I go through in my life. And I know for a fact that he does. And, and, and something that is so powerful to me in Scripture is that when Stephen was being stoned to death and he looked up in the glory and he saw the angels and he saw the things that he saw. One thing that he saw that stands out in my mind is that Jesus Christ was standing at the right hand of the Father. In all other occurrences in the scripture that it talks about Jesus being at the right hand of the Father, it says that Jesus is seated at the right hand of the Father making intercession for us. But as those rocks bounced off of Stephen and as the stones began to take the life from his body, Jesus Christ was filling every blow. Instead of sitting there, and, 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 and he, he stood not, not to honor Stephen, that he was just going through it with him. And, and, and I, I think that we have to remember that in the trials and the tribulations of our life that God is there, his love is there. And we should not get so caught up in, in, in our own defeats that we quit sharing the love of God and what God has done in our life. The gospel message that we are to be presenting to this world is absolutely very simple. Every one of you know it by heart. John 3, 16. For God so what? Loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have what? Everlasting life. He that believeth on him, excuse me, for God sent his son into the world not to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. He that believeth on him is not condemned, but he that believeth not is condemned already, because he hath not believed on the name of the son, only, son, only begotten Son of God. I want you to think about this. <laughs> he didn't come, it, it says if you haven't believed, you're what? 
You're dead already, right? And when that, that soul gets the life of God, when that soul erupts in that breath and, and God moves in and, and they become alive, just, just consider the excitement. Consider what's going on there. And, and, and I just, I really am burdened this morning with the downplaying of what a salvation experience truly is. You know, you can think about the boat tragedy in Branson and the different things. And if only one person would be saved from an accident, should the uh, paramedics and the divers, if it's a water, whatever it is, should they go, well, we got one. Well, what are they going to be about that one? They're still going to be devastated over the losses that weren't saved. But the one that did get saved, the one they got, they are going to celebrate. They're going to be happy that they, that they had that salvation. And, and, and I think too often we get so caught up in our defeats in Christian walk and sharing the love of Christ that we don't share with everybody. Because when you get turned down, you get denied, and you get ridiculed, what happens to us? But don't think of it that way. Think of it as there are five people in that house and that house is burning. I'm going to keep trying until what? They're either gone or saved, right? I'm going to stay with it. And, I, and, and, and I'm not going to go, well, it's too difficult. The situation's too hard. I just can't do it. No, I'm going to try and I'm going to try and I'm going to try. Now that's with a stranger. What if it's your family in that house? How much effort are you going to put in to get them out? I want you to think about that. How much effort are you going to put in to get them out? Today there's a football game going to happen. I like football. I do. I think it's fun to get excited about a game and, say, and, and get aggravated about a game. I, I, I like that rip and tear in your, in, your, in your emotions when that game's going on. If it's not exciting, it's not worth watching. I like a game. I like a football game. There are going to be people today that when their team wins, are going to go out in the streets and scream and shout and hold up certain colors and they're might and they're going to be so passionate. I've been I've been sitting in Bush Stadium and Albert Pujols hit a ball over the wall. Then people act like I don't know what to act. They, they act like they're crazy. And I did it with them. <laughs> Jump up and down, high fiving people. I don't even know because somebody hit a ball over a wall. And they call me a fan. But if I shout about what Jesus Christ has done in my life, they call me one of them weird old religious fanatics. Don't they? What's worth getting excited about? Salvation and eternity with a holy God? Or somebody ran a long way with a ball and got more points? You understand? Again, I get excited over my ducks. But when I begin to get more excited over those successes in my life than knowing that somebody come to Jesus Christ as Savior, I need to reevaluate my priorities. My prayer, my prayer is this, that God help me to put things in perspective. That what is the most important will always stay the most important in my life. Doesn't mean I can't have fun. It doesn't mean I can't yell at a TV. Dawn, you can yell at the TV. You can get mad at that thing. You can say, ah, that team messed up. You can do that. That's all right. There's nothing wrong with that. But when those passions that we have in this world that are all going to wipe away become more important than the salvation of others in our life, then we have a problem. All them mounts that I have in my house and the new ones that I'm going to get, what's going to happen to them someday? It's going to be gone. It's going to be gone. Gone. All these trophies that these teams are winning, this big Stanley Cup that the Blues have right now, what's going to happen to that thing someday? Next year's going to be given to somebody else. 
you can go into any antique store or where they have booths set up, and it's not always antiques, it's just they make them to look like it anyway. You walk through this store, and there will always be a set of deer antlers. An old deer mouth. Somewhere, at some time, somebody stood over that deer in pride. And it became what? Yeah, junk. Became junk to someone else. The things that we, the, the trophies that we acquire and the things that we really, really think are important to us are all going to go away someday. But the one thing that will never fail is the love of the Holy God. And I want above all things for my God to say to me, well done, thou good and faithful servant. I want to be like Paul and say, I fought the good fight, I've kept the faith, and I've finished the course. It doesn't matter how many ducks I have hanging on the wall. Don't tell anybody I said that because I want to get more money. I told you about the guy that caught the world record brown trout a few years ago, 40 pounds, I think four ounces. Big old fish. He had it mounted. Everybody wanted to see it. Everybody came from miles away to see this fish. And when he died, he had a casket made for that thing and, and, and in his will, and that fish was buried with him. Oh. <laughs> he went back to dust, didn't he? It did. Absolutely. I don't get it. I was mad. I wanted to get to see it. Now it's, I get to see pictures. When our trophies are in the wrong place, my Bible says it clearly. Lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven. Where moth and thieves cannot corrupt and rust can thieves can't break in and steal. I kind of misquoted it there, but you know what I mean. I've always been told you can't take anything to heaven. Yes, I can. I can take a friend. I can take a friend. Of all things in my life that I attempt to accomplish, the number one thing is to share the love of Christ and be in the will of God. Stand with me. God, I pray that through my ramblings this morning, Lord, that your word was, was heard. I pray, Lord, that we would prioritize what your work truly is. Help us, Lord, to be excited and celebrate when souls come to know your Son, Jesus Christ, as Savior. God, I pray that we put into perspective the trivial things of our lives. We do thank you for the blessings, Lord, and the fun that you let us have and the victories on earth that we get to, to share, Lord, in those experiences. But God, help us, to, help us to put things in the order they should be, that you and your will will be number one. God, I pray if there's someone here today that does not know your son Jesus Christ as Savior, I pray today to be the day that they accept him. And God, the believer here, Lord, I pray that you would encourage and that you would help us to tweak our lives, Lord, to be more aligned with what you'd have it to be. God, we love you and we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Number 280.